hey, like the uh, kids showed you there in their pageant today, uh, you know, when we look at the calendar, it just happens to be a coincidence okay, that the end of June is the longest day of the year as far as sunshine. December 25th is the shortest day of the year as far as sunshine. Yeah. And then we have a spring and fall equinox, meaning we have a middle point where the sun is sinking faster or, or staying up longer. <laughs> you know, it changes right there. So, so the God of the Bible is the God of all balance. So, of course, he's the God of nature and nature's God. Amen. And so, what a coincidence that the Bible bears this truth out. That when we go to study the life of Jesus and try to figure out when Jesus was born, uh, that these dates would be significant, these seasons of the year would be significant. Now, the Jews always count by the moon. Right. See, uh, we're Gentile, <laughs> Gentile dogs, and we have our uh, Roman civil government and law, and we, 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 you know, we don't have only 30 days for our month. Right. We don't go by the moon. In fact, we go by the sun. Right. We're on a solar calendar, not a lunar calendar. Right. So that's why there are some discrepancies as to when each year, what date the date would be compared to our dates, because our date exists way off compared to God's dates. Right. The Jews always set their festivals to the Lord because God told them how to do it there and told them you know, Leviticus 23 laid it out for them what days were to be special holidays for them. And we'll go over there in a minute. But let's start with Luke 1 here. I want to read you verse 1 of Luke 1. Verse, Much as many have taken in hand set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus is a common name in the Roman Empire. The word Theophilus, you can probably figure it out in the Greek there. Theo, Theos is God. And Philo means love. So he's saying, oh, lover of God, and aren't you, is that what you are? Yeah. Luke wrote this book just for you. <laughs> amen, amen. If you're a lover of God, amen? Right. Most excellent Theophilus. So no doubt when Luke wrote this book originally, he wrote it and dedicated it to somebody named Theophilus. That thou mightest know, notice, see, the Bible, the, our Bible salvation is a no-so salvation. Amen. It's not a hope-so, guess-so, maybe-so. It's a for-sure thing. Amen. I said First John 5, 13, these things are written that you may know ye have eternal life. God wants you to know for sure you're going to heaven. There should be no doubt in your mind if you're going to heaven or hell today. That thou mightest know the certainty of, the, of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now again, on this subject, no one's instructing anyone today. Isn't that sad? Yeah. All of a sudden, we're checking our brain when it comes to when Jesus was born. It shouldn't be any big deal. Luke thought he had to set it all straight for everybody. But we know Christian churches at large today pretend that they don't know and they all just fall in line with whatever the cult of Mary tells them. It was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, God made it very clear in the Old Testament that all the girls of Aaron's house were only married priests. So that's why the Bible mentioned Elizabeth here. They might not, the boys may not be directly of the lineage of Aaron, but as long as their wives were, they could become priests. And uh, so what I'm going to discuss with you today, this afternoon, is just the simple truth. How do we know for sure that this is when Jesus was born? Now, right off the top, what would you say? How do we know for sure Jesus was born at this season of the year, about this time, in the in the September, early October? How do we know that? Go ahead, Marlene. Well, yeah, yeah. There's 
there's a lot of internal evidence like that, yeah. The shepherds were in the fields. Um, uh, Caesar had made a decree all the world would be taxed. Wouldn't that have been stupid to tax everybody in the middle of winter when nobody's got any money anyhow? Uh, especially when they're spending it on Christmas gifts, December 25th, you know? So, so and they did, you got to realize the pagan world did celebrate Baal. Right. And uh, they did celebrate Bacchus. These are, this is an old religion that's been around since the time of Nimrod. Right, so, right, no, right. The, of course, Caesar would have been smart to say, well, let's see now. Everybody's going to cash in their crops at harvest time. So, we'll right. decree that the whole world's got to, everybody's got to go to their hometown and pay their tax at harvest time. You know, when you see the internal evidence, it's, the, it's just crystal clear as the nose on your face. Right. That this is what the Bible says, but this right. is all cooperating testimony. Well, we know it because, first we can say, because well, Zacharias was serving his course uh, as the high priest. The Bible clearly tells us that his particular course was the course of Abijah. Now, this is his nickname. This is the nickname of his family lineage going back to Abijah. Abijah was the Old Testament name of, uh, of the children there of Aaron that was given this time of the year to be the priest. So let's show you that now. We're showing you this now. First Corinthians, first, first Chronicles 24. First Chronicles 24 now. And we'll start at one and read you down to 10. 10 is where we're going. First Corinthians, or first, first Chronicles 24. Now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Now remember, those first two sons <laughs> got burnt to a crisp. <laughs> but Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar executed the priest's office. And David distri distributed uh, them, both Sadik of the sons of Eleazar and Ahimelech of the sons of Ithamar, according to their offices and their service. And there were more chief men found than the sons of El Eleazar. Uh, than of the sons of Ithamar, and thus were they divided. <laughs> Among the sons of Eleazar, there were 16 chief men of the house of their fathers, and eight among the sons of Ithamar, according to the house of their fathers. Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another. For the governors of the sanctuary and the governors of the house of God were of the sons of Eleazar and of the sons of Ithamar. So that's interesting. They were not only called priests, but they were called governors. <laughs> and uh, Shimeiah, the son of Nethaniel, the scribe, one of the Levites, wrote them before the king and the princes, and Zadok the priest, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, and before the chief of the fathers of the priests and Levites, one principal household being taken for Eleazar and one taken for Ithamar. Now the first lot came forth to Jehoiarib, the second to Jediah, the third to Hiram, the fourth to Seorim, the fifth to Alkaijah, the sixth to Majum, this here it is now, the seventh to Hazak, or Hekaz, I mean, Heka, and the eighth to Abijah. Now there it is, see, the eighth course. That's the course of Abijah. The ninth to Jeshua, the tenth to Shekaniah, the 11th to Elisha, the 12th to Jacob, the 13th to Kupa, the 14th to Yeshubi, the 15th to Bilja, the 16th to Immer, the 17th to Hezer, the 18th to Ephesus, Ephesus the 19th to Pithiah, the 20th to Jezekiel, the 1 and 20th to Jacob, the 2 and 20th to Gamal, the 3 and 20th to Deliah, the 4th and 20th to Masiah. These were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner under Aaron, their father, as the Lord God of Israel commanded them. So now there you got the order of what these men were to do. God said, how many of them was there? 24. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When we're zooming in on Abaya, the course of Abaya, because he's the eighth. 
In other words, each one of these 24 men were given one week to serve as priests. So it would be their job to go in the temple and take care of all the duties and services of the temple. In particular, we read that Eliezer's, I mean, that uh, Provijah, I mean, is the eighth. So, so in other words, when they start counting their, week, their, their weeks of the year, the first week, the first guy's family got it. The second week, the second guy's family got it in the perpetuity. So in the eighth week of the year, the eighth week of the year, it would have been Zacharias. Amen. Okay. Now, we know when the Jews count their years, count their weeks, count their months. Like I said, they're a little different than ours. There's months when it has 30 days in it, but there's 12 months in a year. And they go by the moon. Because the moon cycles every 29 point, what is it, 29 point, somewhere between 29.7 years, seven days. Because the truth is that moon, buddy, sometimes, again, it depends on uh, what side of the moon the sun the sun is on and stuff, because the sun will pull the moon paper. Sometimes it's 30 full days, the moon cycles. But it, the moon fluctuates and it's traveling. And so it's like 29.7 days is how long it takes the moon to go through its cycle as it goes around the earth and how it's cycling around the earth with the sun. So we know that the eighth course, during the course of Abaya, that that puts him being in the service of the Lord in June. In June. And uh, technically, it's from the 12th to 18th of Sivan, which is June 13th to 19th. That's the week of Easter. Now, how many is there? 24. How many weeks in a year? 52. 52. So, what's, something don't match up here. What's going on? Well, everybody would have to be the priest two times a year for two different weeks of the year. So they start with the old, the, the first guy is drawn by lots and go to the, so his service happens to be in June. Okay, well when's he going to be priest again? See what I'm saying? Can you see that? What a coincidence! Uh -huh. What a coincidence! So when you talk about the course of Abaya, you've got to recognize the simple truth that, yes, he was the priest for one week. His first assignment in the first of the year would have come up in June. Right. But now his last assignment will end up coming, because after they go through all the 24 guys, and then all the fellas serve as priests for the three big feast days of the Lord. Right. They all the priests came together, served together for uh, Pentecost, for uh, Passover for uh, tabernacles, and uh, they were all required to, for, for, for the order of, of, of three of the great feasts. Now, here's what I want to show you. And it's important you get this. Because, well, let me get a little further first. Let me get a little further. So, this is one of the ways we know when Jesus was born. Because it says that Zechariah was of the course of Abiah. And then like the kids showed you today, and they even walked across with their big placard showing you what time of the month, they, uh, what time of the year it was. <coughs> it's so good. Uh, they walked by the commandments. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren. They both were now well stricken in years. Verse 8, it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. See, this is when it was his time. Now, this is when he served as priest. And he did the, the job, and he was doing, like I said there, he's fixing the incense, take care of the incense. And always the priest wore a robe. And on the bottom of those robes were little pomegranate bells made like pomegranates. And the priest always, when he was in there, because he's behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies, so he's always ring a ring a ring a ching a ching a ching a so that they knew he was okay. Right, right. See, though the man could put up a good front, 
they knew they were just men in the flesh. Yeah. Right? So they always had a rope around their leg uh -huh. in case they fell dead in the presence of God, they right. could pull them out of it. Right. <laughs> and this is why the Bible makes a big deal out of it when all of a sudden he stops and he's talking to this angel in there. Right. And the people outside know something's up, something's going on because they don't hear the chinga 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 no more. Something's going on. He must be having a vision or something. Because they can hear he stopped. They might even heard him mumbling and talking to himself, they thought. <laughs> no, he's talking to an angel, the angel of the Lord. Amen. Right. Talking to Gabriel. So it's so interesting. He's going in there saying he's doing the job of the priest. Now, he does his job. The angel told him, hey, man, you guys are going to get your prayers answered. You're supposed to be in there offering the prayers of Israel, right. burning the incense. The truth is, he's in there praying for him and his wife. He says, man, Lord, we're getting old. We ain't going to be able to keep up with the young if we don't have one pretty soon. Would you please, Lord, give us a baby? And God, since his angels say, hey, guess what? God's going to give you your baby. And, of course, he really don't believe it. Right. And because he really don't believe it, because he come up with all kinds of excuses why they can't have a baby, the angel said, okay, he wants a proof. He says, oh, can you prove this to me somehow? And he said, yeah, I'll prove it to you. You ain't going to be able to talk for nine months. Yeah. Yeah. So sure enough, he comes out of there, and he can't even tell the people because the people grab him. What happened to you? <laughs> they finally figure it out. You know, he uses some kind of sign language or something. He kind of let them know that, yeah, I seen an angel of the Lord in there. And so, no doubt, the Bible tells us after nine months when the baby comes along. By now, of course, he's finally got his tablet with him. And he always writes on a chalk tablet. He's able to communicate with him. And then finally, of course, God loses his tongue. And he tells us, that boy's name is John. Don't you read it there? Call him Zechariah. So, it's so cool when you see that and understand what the Bible's saying here. So, uh, bearing in mind that all the courses served together at the great three, uh, the three great feasts, the dates two yearly ministrations of Abiah would be uh, seen like December 6th and 12th and the second ministration was between the uh, 13th and 19th of June. The announcement therefore of Zacharias in the temple as to the conception of John the Baptist took place around 12, around uh, June 13th and 19th in the year 5 BC after finishing his ministration. The aged priest departed to his own house, Luke 1.23 which was in a city in the hill country of Judah. That's what verse 39 tells you. So the angel tells him, hey, guess what? God's going to answer your prayer. You're going to get, get to have a baby. But now he's got to finish being the priest. He waits the whole week, of course, because he's got to finish his job. Now he gets done with the job. Now he's got to head back to the hill country of Judah. So he heads out, and it takes him at least three days to get home. See, I mean, he's just living his life. He don't have a clean even thinking about what the longest, shortest day of the year and all. Of course not. He's just trying to get to Elizabeth. Tell us good news. Right. And then sure enough, she conceives. You know. So Zach gets with his wife. Sure enough, she conceives. And then she's thinking, man, I'm an old woman. I know how easy it is for an old woman to lose a baby. Right. These people ain't stupid. So she hit herself. But she did she didn't go to the grocery store, she didn't do nothing. So Zach had to run back and forth. Take care of it. And she knew, hey man, I better stay in. So she didn't do nothing for five months. And finally, the Bible says in her sixth month, he goes married to Sarah. Mary right, decides right. to stay on, but you're not. She has a little baby, Zach, or has, yeah. has a little baby, John, I mean. And then, of course, she goes back home because now Mary's going to have her baby. Right. The Bible tells us there how they were cousins. And the angel told her, hey, you're cousin. Mary, you're going to want to go see her because guess what? She's going to have a baby too. So it's so fascinating. Luke 1, you know, you just got to love the Word of God. It's so detailed and it's all there on purpose. Right. This is how we know when Jesus was born because we know when John the Baptist was born. Right. And it's a dead giveaway there that he was serving in the course of Abaya. And we know when that is. Now again, I bring these things out because, okay, that means but finally, you know, he's able to get with his wife. It takes him about three days to finally get with her. So now she finally could see. So then when would he be born? Well, he'd be born about March 25th or the 28th, somewhere. Nine months later, you know, give or take a year or two. Right. <laughs> Amen? Right. That's right. how things right. naturally are. Again, what a coincidence. Mm -hmm. 
and it just happens to be the spring equinox. See, it's almost like God's showing his signature hand and everything. Yeah. Amen. Now, it's important you get this. Because we know that then Jesus is going to be born six months after John. Right. Right. Everybody lays it all out for you there in Luke 1. How that, well, look, uh, Mary goes to see her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth's already six months along. Here she's just conceived Jesus of the Holy Ghost. So, of course, she hanged with her cousin for three months. Right. Elizabeth had John the Baptist. Now she's got to get home because she's three months along, and in six more months she's going to have her Jesus be. So when would that be, then? John the Baptist is conceived the last of June. In birth, March, tail end of March, March 25th. Okay, six months later, Jesus then would be born around the end of September or October. Because he'd be on Jesus just six months. Everything is happening six months behind John the Baptist. Right. Amen. So, though he's born September 28th, when was Jesus conceived then? Back there where the Bible said in Luke, the angel came in unto her. Meaning she's indoors. Of course you're always indoors in the wintertime. Aren't you more indoors than outdoors in the wintertime? I am. <laughs> I try to be. <laughs> and just like when Jesus went up to the uh, Feast of Dedication, the Bible says, as in, and it was winter. Right. I mean, again, if you look at a parallel of a globe of where America is and Michigan is and uh, right. Connecticut is and New Jersey is, and then you follow that line around the edge where you can see clearly what the weather's like on the other side of the world. Yep. Right. Um, the snows of Mount Hermon that David talked about are snows on Mount Hermon. Right. You say, well, what's Mount Hermon? Oh, that just happens to be the giant mountain that feeds the Lake Sea of Galilee. So, so we know Jesus was born based on these things. But now I'm going to present a problem for you. A few years ago, how many of you have ever seen that paper called The Sword of the Lord? There's a popular fundamental Baptist publication called The Sword of the Lord. And they print sermons of old preachers in there. And it's very interesting to read because there's some great sermons of some great preachers in but of course, they really just kind of push the cult of soul winning. And they don't really get too deep in the Bible on too many things. So in order to try to bolster their position and, and, and show the whole world that they're right in celebrating Christmas on December 25th, one day, many years ago, I seen an article on the front page of the Sword of Lord, and I'm sure they publish it probably every year, explaining how we know December 25th is when Jesus was born. And the guy said, well, sure, we know he was born December 25th. Because it said the course of Abiah, so Abiah had a course December 25th. So he had a course on December 25th, and nine months later, John the Baptist was born. And... Six months later, March 25th, Jesus should have been born. But when he was all done, he had it. Jesus being born on December 25th. He just twisted things totally out of context. Because Abiah did serve more than one time during the year. And he used that point of confusion to build his argument on. So that if you didn't know better, you'd say, wow, there's a guy, the sword of the Lord, man. He really proved that Jesus was born December 25th. And yet, wait a minute, way you get December 25th. But they use that confusing point of Obiah's second service. Yeah. Yes. And it sounded logical. Because when I read it, I said, man, this is cheap. Never mind. Shepherds don't watch their flocks in the middle of wintertime. They put them all in the sheep coats, which we know are in Bethlehem, because I found Joy in one. I have her picture I'm standing in there. We were there in February. She's, we all got our jackets on. Believe me, it's cool in February in Bethlehem, because I was there. There's a lot of frost on the pumpkin. And, uh, and uh, that's where Jesus talked about. You take the sheep and you put them in the sheep coats. You put a, the sheep, and they have these caves there. And they put them in there. And then the, Jesus said, I am the door. Because the shepherd always sits in the door so the sheep can't get out. Right. So 
media, they just kind of feed their flocks in the caves and in the sheep coats, the Bible speaks of, in the wintertime. Because you don't want to take them out in the wintertime. Why? Wolves don't have so many berries to eat. And right. wolves and lions and tigers and bears like to eat little sheep in the wintertime. Right. <laughs> so the shepherds have gotten real smart if they hold their animals up in the winter. Put them in caves so there's no secret back door. And they even block up the front with rocks and cement it in so that they sit in the doorway so nothing can get to the sheep. And the sheep can't get out either. Thank God he is the door. Amen. So that's why it's important that you know this and understand these simple truths. We know it because of what the Bible says in the course of Abiah was, and then it was Zacharias' turn to be the priest. And also, we know it secondly because. Leviticus 23 tells us when God told the Jews to have their feast days. And these feast days, the Bible says these things were our samples uh, to show us Christ. Amen. And so these things were types and shadows to show us Christ. And we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these feast days. Look at Leviticus 23 now. Let's start here at verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In other words, their seasons. Jesus have heard, besides the men cussing and spitting in his face when he was hanging on the cross, he'd been meeting with his disciples all that week in the night, in the evenings, having supper with them. Because it was leading up to the Passover right. preparation. Right. And he said, I'm getting ready for the Passover. And so that it was a preparation, the Bible says, of the Passover. So that then when they grabbed Jesus, resting, put him through that mock trial that night, and hung him on the cross the next day, Jesus could have heard them little lamb. Right? He's cutting their throats. But Jesus was God's Passover lamb. Amen. Jesus fulfilled this Jewish celebration. Because right. yeah. God told him, look, fellas, someday when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over you. So I want you to make sure on the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work thereon, therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work there. In other words, it was to be a Sabbath. That's why the Bible says in John 19, how these guys, that, you know, because it was going to be Passover, of course, then the way it was supposed to work on that day. It was to be a Sabbath day. It was to be a holiday because it was a holiday. It was a high day. So, so he dies and his sacrifice is our Passover lamb. Then they immediately take him. What do they do? The next thing they do, they, they take him and put him in the ground. Because he's the bread of life. And so the unleavened bread, see, he's pure. He has no sin in him. He's unleavened bread. He's, he's like a flat cake. There's no, there's no yeast in him. There's no impurity in him. He never drank wine. Amen, that's right. Even when they tried to give him drugs when he was hanging on the cross, he wouldn't take it. That's right, amen. That's my Jesus. Amen. And so praise the Lord. So they immediately put him in the ground because, amen, he's cooking in the ground. They had by, they had uh, ovens in the ground back in the Bible days where they had these new convection ovens and stuff. They let it sit out there in that sun and bake. Amen. Jesus was putting the ground and he went through the fire because he's God's unleavened bread. So the very next day, he says, that's going to be a holiday. That's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it was a picture of Jesus, how Jesus had no sin in it. And now, what happens? Well, John, I hear uh, Moses is going to tell him here. God's going to tell Moses now. Mel Moses. Now, the day after the Sabbath of that week, whenever that Feast of Unleavened Bread is going down, a seven-day feast, whenever you guys get to a Sabbath during that week, the very next day, on the first day of the week, you're going to celebrate the 
feast of first fruits. Right. Just like the Sabbath. It's going to be a holy day. No sort of our work. Right. So it's the Sabbath for me. Like you're right. not to do nothing. You just keep it holy, just like you would a Sabbath day. Because, man, this is a holy day for me. Of course, the Jews are scratching their head. Moses scratches his head. Uh, oh, first day of the week. Okay, God, if you say so. What was that showing us? Jesus is coming. Yeah. Amen. He's going to rise from the dead on the first day of the week. Amen. And the first day of the week is just as holy as any seventh day you ever found. Because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. That's why the Jews crucified Christ. Christ was constantly telling them Jews with their Sabbath keeping that it's not good enough. Right. Right. You've got an uncircumcised heart. But good's keeping the Sabbath if your heart's not circumcised. Amen. And they hated him for that. Picking corn, not washing his hands, and all the other things he did. Because he was constantly breaking their Sabbath. Uh huh. That's right. And he had to tell him in Mark. We read it where he said, "I'm the Lord of the Sabbath." Right. You ain't telling me when I gotta go to church and when I don't have to go to church. Amen. God made that for man to rest. And like I said this morning, the Sabbath is God's memorial day that He set up to remind you of creation Amen. and the fact that you live in a geocentric universe. Amen. It's amazing. So many clown Christians claim to be creation and not even believe it. Right. <laughs> what could it say you believe in creation and yet not accept that he made the world geocentric? Right. So now, our second feast, he said, the second convocation was, in verse 9, the unleavened bread. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak of children of Israel, saying to them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. Now, what is the morrow after the Sabbath? Sunday! On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Because, amen, he went through hell for it. The meat Offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine and fourth part of hen, of a hen, and, and ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. Everyone was expected to bring an offering. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So see, Jesus arose on the first day of the week. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus Christ was the first fruits of the resurrection. So he rose on Sunday. So all happened in one week. He's crucified. He's offered as the Passover lamb. The Feast of Unleavened Bread immediately commences the next day as he's put in the ground and he's cooking for three days and nights. And then, boom, he comes out. Right, not bad. And it's to be celebrated. Because God said so right here. And they're not to do anything on that day or treat it like a Sabbath. Right. Okay, we move on now. Verse 15, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So seven times seven is? Forty-nine. Okay, well, what would the day be after? 49. It'd be 50. And if you're counting Sabbaths, that would be again the first day of the week. Yep. Amen. This is what the New Testament calls the day of Pentecost. Pente, five, 50 days Amen. afterward. Pentecost. And did anything happen? Uh -huh. Was anything fulfilled in the Bible? Yeah. Of course. God sent his Holy Ghost down and dwell the believers and they spake in tongues and he heard the words of God and great multitudes were saved and baptized. So so far, uh, so far, uh, we're running pretty good. All these things are showing us Jesus. And Jesus is fulfilling every cotton pig in one of them. Amen. Verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Again, notice what they're to do on Sunday. What are they to do? Oh, just go out and work. Don't worry about it. Do some roof jobs. Don't care. No, no. Look at it. He says, <laughs> verse 21, do no servile work therein. Uh -huh. Holy mackerel. The Catholic Church didn't fit. Nobody working at Blue Laws on Sunday. Amen. 
Amen. God said it in Leviticus 23. Some, recently some guys came to our church and they tried to give us some papers. And I got it right here. Because I plan to put it on them when I see them again. <laughs> I just had to go through and you know, laugh at the thing and say, man, I can't wait till he comes back to church. We straighten that boy out. But I just casually mentioned to him, well, you know, the Bible says in Leviticus 23 that, of course, the first day of the week, Sunday's the day of the Sabbath with God. Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, that's right. It must not have been in the Seventh-day Adventist books you were reading. Right. <laughs> I, read, I read enough of the books that it came right out, some things he said, and I said, no, he didn't get that out of the Bible. He read that out of a book from the Sabbath. Right. You can con some cons, but you can't con an old con. That's right. <laughs> Amen. So notice, he says, they are to do no certain work. Amen. Verse 22, when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of the field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor, or to the stranger, unto the Lord your God. So notice there was to be an in-harvest feast as well. In other words, they weren't supposed to look so stingy as to pick up every last crumb. If some crumbs got dropped by the combine or the tractors, and you just cut it, make a round turn, Leave the corners for the animals. See, God had a natural way to feed the animals. We don't need DNR. Uh, he's made a natural way to feed the animals. He made it for poor people. Somebody's poor, don't have no food, don't have a field. They're allowed to go to those corners and get all they want and eat it. Like yeah. Jesus and the disciples did on many occasions. Yeah, right. That was the welfare of their day. Right. It was okay. Notice the next feast. Feast of Trumpets, verse 23, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking unto the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, now again, if their months are based on the moon, the cycling of the moon, and it's the first day of the month, my guess is that would be Sunday again. Ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. <laughs> Now, does the Bible anywhere talk about blowing trumpets? Something to do with Jesus? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. What does it say? It says, someday Jesus is coming back at the yes. sound of the trumpet. Yes. So, though they, I'm sure, did this, this is pointing that someday Jesus is coming back. Amen. And somebody's going to be blowing a trumpet. Michael the Archangel is going to be blowing on a trumpet. Amen. Just like the Bible says he will there in right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Like it says over in Revelation, the second advent, there's a blowing of a trumpet again. Right. Oh, amen. So if a guy wasn't real careful, he might actually think he can figure out the date that Jesus was coming back. Yeah. Yep. Because if God was so meticulous about how the feasts were fulfilled, and he sure seemed to be to me, yeah. I wonder if even that trumpet day might be the day he comes back and blows the trumpet. Amen. Amen. He said that trumpet day, no servile work again, verse 25. Treat it just like it's a Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Verse 27, also on the tenth day of this seventh month. So see, we had those feasts in the spring. Then we had the one 50 days later. Then now we have all these feasts in the fall. And that's why even right now, it's what? Uh, Yom Kippur today? Yep. Yes. Baby told me. It's going to be the blowing of trumpets this week and the Feast of Tabernacles begins Thursday and Friday. It's always evening in the morning or the next day. Right, right, right. So, so we're right on schedule. And so the Amen. Bible tells us, yes, the fifth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation of you. And you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, we can honestly say that since Jesus offered his soul an offering for us, he made atonement through his blood. Amen. There's no doubt. That's right. This was partially fulfilled right there. Because my Jesus was my atonement. He was the atonement lamb. He was my Passover. But this is a separate date because really uh, what we're reading is a prophecy here. Because these Jews during the tribulation period... For Israel to be restored, they're going to have to make some atonement. you got to realize the king of the Jews was crucified by the nation of the Jews the first time he came. Right. Right. So that's why he's putting them through Jacob's trouble, uh -huh. yep. Jeremiah called 
because they're going to make some atonement. They're yeah. going to shed some of their blood, and some of their skin and meat's going to be eaten by the son of Satan. That's right. And they're going to make some atonement for their sins. And that's kind of what this is talking about, the day of atonement. Right. Mark my bones if it's not in the fall of the year, when the tribulation, uh, the great tribulation of Jacob's trouble will begin. But notice it shall be, verse 32, it shall be a Sabbath of rest. Ye shall afflict your souls in the night. Shall ye celebrate your Sabbath? Here again, now, now he's even, holy mackerel, why did you do this, Jesus? We had a good thing going, getting these people conned into being Seventh-day Adventists and celebrating Sabbath day all the time. But now you're calling the, the holidays of the first day a Sabbath. Shall ye celebrate your Sabbath? In other words, right. this was to be another Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Man, if you're a real King James Bible believer, yeah. Yeah. oh man, it sure fixes a lot. Hey, right. hey, you just believe Amen. the Bible. Amen. Now notice the last feast. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast. Uh, tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So notice, it's a seven day celebration. Notice it was to start the 15th day of the month. That's significant. That'll preach too, all by itself. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do it on the first day again. Man, you're really messing me up, Jesus. It's almost always be Sabbath and Sabbath. Never in first one. Did you get me all mixed up, Jesus? Pick it up with Jesus, man. <laughs> Wouldn't it be easier just to be in the cult, write your own Bible? Yeah. Yeah, that's why they do it. Exactly. No, whatever fits. Oh, thank the Lord. He's got clinkers in here, see? Amen. Mm -hmm. If you want to go to hell, you can go to hell if you want to. He's not going to force you to go to hell. Amen. The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, and on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work, servile work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. And you shall do no servile work therein. Well, that's what he always says about the Sabbath. Now again, what does the Bible tell us? Bible told us how that, yes, when John the Baptist, we just seen it, when John the Baptist, mom and daddy brought that little baby in on the eighth day to get circumcised. There's Simeon the priest, there's Anna. Give her a blessing. Six months later, six months later, here comes Mary and Joseph to bring Jesus. Eighth day. Bring them in to be circumcised the eighth day, yeah. What about this tabernacle? God was, his name's Emmanuel. God with us. Jesus was God tabernacling in flesh. Amen, amen. He was born on this 15th day of the month. He's born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And he circumcised on the eighth day. Right. Listen, this is supposed to be a holy day. You ain't allowed to go very far. You can't do work. On certain days, being a Jew, right. and yet God had it all set up. It's a seven-day feast, but on the eighth day, right. and Jesus was circumcised when? It wasn't the sixth day. That's it right. wasn't the ninth eighth day. Right. It was the eighth day. Amen. Why? Paul said, verse 15, this gospel we preach is according to the scriptures. That's right. You think Jesus is la di da Oh, what time is it? It don't matter. I'm God. I can just do anything I want. I can be born anytime I want. I can die anytime I want. No, no, you can't. you got to be on God's schedule. Amen. 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 Everything you do has to be according to the Scripture. That's right. Amen. And guess what? It was. Amen. It was. That's what I'm saying. It was. Amen. And so the argue, argument of the course of a bias is great. But I'm telling you, watch it, because some clowns want to butcher that and say, well, look, Obiah served in December. And I've heard people preach, because they've never read their Bible far enough, 
and say, I think Jesus was born in March. <laughs> Another thing that just happens to be, again, you know, once you get this, now the whole Bible opens up, everything makes so much sense. Now, when did John the Baptist start preaching? No man could preach until he's 30 years old. So one day, 30 years later, here comes John the Baptist. Right. Baptizing people. He's baptizing all summer. Then along comes Jesus when he turns 30. Hey. And John baptizes him and he takes over. Amen. And it's a three and a half year ministry. Now again, when these clowns start changing things, now he ain't 33 and a half when he dies. Because, oops, nope. We're going to say he was born here. Okay, so you're saying he's conceived here. And you're saying John the Baptist was conceived at some point. Now everything's all screwed up. Now we've got people in the middle of winter going to pay their taxes. It makes no sense. At all. No sense. You've got shepherds freezing to death. Got, got poor Jesus almost freezing to death as soon as he's born because Mary, of all the stupid things, she lays him in a crop, big manger and turns her back on him. With, with only squatting clothes on. Why didn't she have the comforter from the bed on her? Do some, <laughs> don't she knows it's supposed to snow that night? Why does she take a, 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 a manger, something you feed animals in? There's nowhere in the Bible that the Bible says Jesus was born in a barn. Nowhere. That's right. It was a lot like an afternoon day like we have. It's hot. Jesus says, hey, uh, Jesus. Uh, Mary, Mary says, here, here, Jesus. Just lay right here, son. I got to take care of your dad's clothes. I got to throw things to do. She lays him in a manger. She turns away from Jesus. She just lays him in a feed trough of an animal outside. Because there's no room in the inn. No room in the inn because it's Feast of Tabernacles. All the motels are out. All the Jews are back in their home. Everybody's celebrating. But they're traveling in December. Yeah, they say no, no, no. It's December. <laughs> Makes no sense. Right? Hey, it don't work. It's none of it works. None of it works. None of it works. So the Abaya argument is good, but now we nail her down because now we go to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 nails it down. Where Jesus, of course, one third of all the Bible has come true, but two thirds are yet to happen. And will they happen? Of course they will! Yeah, yeah. Of course, it's prophecy. It will happen. Amen. In fact, a lot of it's double prophecies. Right. And when he comes back, he's coming back right on schedule. Yep. But it's interesting. Because again, now if these guys were right, Jesus is, uh, if John the Baptist uh, it makes total sense that Jesus would be baptized in the fall. But when they're done fooling with you, you know, it's going to be a totally different time of the year. It's, it's not going to, for sure, they going to match all these mm -hmm. times of the year. That right. There's no Feast of Tabernacles fulfillment. There's nothing. Then the icing on the cake is Zechariah 14. Let's look at that. I'm done. When Jesus Christ comes back, when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, of all these feasts that God's going to reinstitute on the earth, now again, now we, we don't understand this a lot because, you know, we think, wait a minute, Jesus has died for the sins of the world, right? The blood of Jesus, that's once for all. You don't have to worry about ever going to hell. You're saved. You can't go to hell if you want to. But yet when Jesus comes back, and he's sitting in the throne of his father David in Jerusalem, and David's ruling over uh, Israel from Bethlehem. Because that's quite the city of David. He was born there, and that's where he'll run Israel too. But he's a... Uh, He's a vice for you. Know, he's a vice regent. He's, he's, he's an associate of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, now during the thousand year reign of Christ, of all these feasts, look what it says here in Zechariah 14. Go, the day of the Lord cometh, and, they, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem, so forth, so on. The mono olives will cleave asunder, verse 4. Uh, verse 5, ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. The Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Are you coming back? 
all the saints with me. Brother Williamson, he doesn't believe that we're coming back. He don't understand that we're coming back. No one's ever showed him this verse in the Bible yet. It shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. So he's going to run the world for a thousand years. He's going to be the king. Verse 11, Men shall dwell in it, there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague, uh-oh, wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Woo! Sounds like a neutron bomb going off there when Jesus Amen. comes back, don't it? I wouldn't be surprised. Verse 16. Now. This shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Oh! Isn't that interesting? Everybody's going to come to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Amazing. Of all these feasts, he's not got them keeping the Feast of Passover. Right. He's not keeping them the Feast of, uh, uh, of Atonement. He's not having them. He's having them keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Amen. Yeah. They're to worship the king. Amen. This shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king. Oh, you don't really have to. I mean, he's the king, sure, but you don't really have to. Somebody's going to be saying that. The people are going to believe it. They're going to be teaching false doctrine. Yep. It shall be whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall no rain, shall be no rain. So again, while he's running the world for a thousand years, if people don't come and celebrate his birthday, the Feast of Tabernacles, they will get no rain in the next year and have no problem. Right, right. Not just that. We read about that plague in verse 12, didn't we? Yep. Uh -huh. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have and that have no rain, there shall be the plague. Yep. Guys, eyeball falling down. The plague. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to the keep the feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of Tabernacles. In other words, I really do believe that because the whole world's got it wrong tonight, today. The whole world is following after the Antichrist, and when he says to worship, when Jesus comes back for the thousand years, he's saying, listen, you better come, and then we just read and bring a gift. Yes. I believe it's happy birthday yeah. to you. Yeah, we should get it right this time. To <laughs> you. Happy birthday, yeah. dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Amen. I believe on purpose because Jesus has heard these Baptists sliding him every year saying, well, nobody really knows. Luke didn't really mean that you could know for certainty nothing. Go with our newest version that for sure nobody knows nothing. And so, and Jesus says, you know what? These clowns think they're going to get away with this. Just because I never told them they had to worship my birthday? Okay, when I come back, if you don't come and you don't worship the king, burn, baby, burn. That's right. <laughs> so my philosophy is why not get in practice now? Amen. If I wanted to keep some day of the week or celebrate something out of the Bible and somehow honor God, I would definitely want to be in church, peace of tabernacle. Amen. Even in 2011. Because I'm kind of getting in practice now, getting on my knees. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee's going to bow, and every tongue confession, glory to God the Father. 
Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. And he's not just going to be Lord on that day. He's Lord today. Amen. 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 Let's all stand by our heads in prayer. Good. Lord, thank you for this chance to show our people and remind them of the clear Bible reasons why we believe Jesus really did fulfill the scriptures. Everything he did was according to the scriptures. You can see these scriptures. And like Luke said, he wrote it for our certainty. Of these things that we were instructed. We're not just worshiping a God and a Jesus and reading these things in the Bible of Moses, Pilate, and these men. And then history pretends, oh, uh, we don't know if there ever was a real Moses. Uh, we don't know if there ever was a real Pilate. And though archaeology finds these truths every day, they hide them because they don't want people to believe the Bible. They want to make them think it's all made up, like the Book of Mormon and all that junk in there is made up. It's just a religion, just a belief, a faith of somebody, even if it's a misplaced faith. Lord, thank you that we have a pure word of prophecy, mm. like Peter told us. We can be sure of where we stand. But Lord, we pray for our friends. Some of them, they don't know. Sometimes we come off being older than thou. Lord, help us not yep. be that way. Amen. But boy, when you're excited because you know something's true, and you really do know the Lord, you can't help but come off a little cocky sometimes. Right? We know where we're going. We know how we got here. We know uh, your promise is true. So help us do what we can to wake up our friends, especially those who say they believe in King James' word of God. And uh, protect us now, Lord. You know the things we got to do this week. I don't even know how we're going to get it all done and get there. You know all things, God. Continue to meet our needs. Forgive us for our many sins and our shortcomings. And thinking of ourselves more than others. And for somebody here, they've never bowed the knee to Christ. We pray they'll do that today and trust Him as their Savior so they can go to heaven. And some of us, maybe we've been saved. We have not really 